This is Introduction to Analysis of Next-Gen Sequencing. Uh, my name is Tristan. Um, I work in the Center for Bioinformatics. Uh, we handle a lot of the sequencing data. Um, on Tuesday, I talked about the sort of sequencing technologies we have. Now, I will today give you a sort of overview of um, how to analyze some of that data, uh, specifically mostly geared towards data generated by the Illumina uh, sequencers. Um, but some of this is applicable well, to ion torrent data as well. All right. So here's a quick overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, I will talk about the sort of raw data files that you get and some of the basic sort of quality control that you might want to um, do on them. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, how you align reads uh, to a reference sequence. And then I will go over in some detail uh, two sort of major applications of the Illumina uh, sequencing. One is ChIP-seq and the other is uh, RNA-seq analysis. Um, just as a quick overview, uh, ChIP-seq uh, use chromatin immunoprecipitation um, to pull out um, protein of interest, that, which has been cross-linked to some part of the uh, DNA sample that you have that you fragmented. Um, this is obviously used to find the locations where those proteins are bound to the genome. Um, RNA-seq, uh, two of the most common things you might want to do with RNA-seq is that you have some species. You may or may not have the reference genome, but you are interested in figuring out what its transcriptome is. Um, the other, uh, generally if you have already a good idea of what its transcriptome is, is to study the gene expression levels in various cell types uh, under different conditions and how the gene expression levels have changed. Um, and there are, of course, many ways to use the sequencing technologies. Uh, there is methods for investigating methylation in, in DNA, which is actually just a little bit of a variant on ChIP-seq. Uh, seq uh, which is similar to ChIP-seq, except you're basically using um, the, the cross-link with formaldehyde of histones to um, um, pull out only the regions which are histone-free. Uh, CHIPS-EXO, which is a more accurate version of ChIP-seq, where you basically digest in around the edges, and we'll see what, later why that is sort of more useful. And basically, like, someone can use some method of selecting DNA, and stick the word seek on it because they throw it in the sequencing machine. And that actually happens a lot. You know, people just do something and then they say, now we've sequenced it and this is a new paper. Okay. Here's a diagram of your basic workflow. Um, I'll come back to the diagram several times just so we're always sort of clear where we are. Um, so you have your source material, however you've selected it put it into some sequencing pipeline, in this case, aluminum. Out the other end will come your raw data, the FASTQ data format. Uh, you'll do your quality control and trimming. You usually come down to your alignment. And from the alignment stage, you can either go over and do your sorts of chip seek analysis or the sorts of analysis that you do um, with RNA-seq. So your raw sequence data. Uh, we often call it raw sequence data. It's not really raw uh, in the sense of this is not like the most raw version of the data because the raw version, especially like with Illumina sequencing, is really all those images of the different uh, clusters and the wavelengths that you're getting out of them. But in this sense, for most researchers, the raw data is just the actual sequences themselves. Um, we always provide them in these sort of general formats, either FASTA or FASTQ. Uh, no matter what sequencing technology they come from. And we usually provide them in a compressed format to make them smaller. And at this point, most bioinformatics tools, you don't even have to uncompress your data. When we give you a compressed FASTQ file, a lot of programs will simply just read that in and automatically uh, uncompress it itself. So you can keep your data in a fairly small format. Um, FASTA is a very simple format. Uh, it's just a text file. Uh, you can see here. Uh, you have an angle bracket, you get some sequence ID, 
then you list out the entire sequence, then you, next time you have a new sequence, another angle bracket. Um, one thing you'll notice sometimes is some places still will try to make this human readable in that it will only put out like 80 or 50 lines of the sequence at a time and then put a, a character return. So it sort of makes a nice little column. Uh, it turns out that it's not so much of a problem with FASTA files, but it's really better for most programs not to have that there and to only always consider all the sequence to be on one line. This actually turns out to be a lot more of a problem with FASTQ files. FASTQ files, based on a, um, a more detailed version of the FASTA file, that is angle bracket, you have an at symbol, a sequence ID. Um, this is the format you'll be getting your data out of the Illumina machines after we've done the initial processing on them. Sequence ID will be very long. It will contain a lot of information. A lot of it is machine specific. And then it will have usually at the end an ID that uniquely identifies each individual read just sort of alphanumerically. Um, like the FASTA format, it contains the sequence itself. Then it has this little plus symbol. And then it has a string of characters. And each of these characters represents the quality encoding of the sequences up here. Now, the reason why it's bad that this sometimes has a character return in these is that the plus symbol is actually one of the quality values. Uh, you can see why this is bad, because it makes any program that has to parse this has to make a decision about when it sees a plus symbol, whether it's a separator of sequence or it is part of one of these quality screens. Um, and then these files are just tons and tons of these entries like this. They just keep repeating one each for read that you got out of your machine. OK, data quality. So at this point, there were a lot of different competing quality scores for a while, but everyone has basically um, uh, standardized on the FRED quality score system that the Sanger Institute used. Um, this is a logarithmic score. Um, it's sort of a, a fixed value of determining uh, the probability that you have an error. Uh, it doesn't matter what sequencing system you use. They all output the same style of quality score now. Um, of course, they internally have their own metrics to determine what that quality score was. Like in the Illumina systems, you know, it's a question of how strong the signal was from each cluster, how close it was to other clusters, and how unambiguous it got its signal from there. Um, so you can see down here in the table, um, quality scores of 10 and 20, not very good. Error rate 1 in 110, 1 in 100. Um, generally, we release data will, uh, that gets released has a value between 30 and 40. Typically, um, there's this, excuse me, uh, two sort of bulk metrics that I look at before releasing data. Uh, one is just the average quality score of every lead within a particular sample. Um, and if it's between 32 or higher, um, I've never really seen scores go higher than 39 with Illumina. Um, you know, it looks good. There's another value called uh, the Q30 plus, which is the percentage of your bases, which is above the value of 30. Um, obviously, it'll be that value will also be high if your average is high. Um, but it's also good metrics because it tells you the um, number of specific reads that are above 30. Um, and in the next uh, few things, you'll see why that's kind of important. Because it could be that your average is just being brought down by a few bad reads. 